Welcome to Innovating with Scott Amix. I'm your host, Scott Amix, and I'm joined by Sergey Young, founder of the Longevity Vision Fund. Welcome, Sergey. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, my understanding is that some five, six years ago, your doctor told you that you were at a high risk of heart disease. Yeah. And that your cholesterol levels were higher than normal. And they prescribe uh, stents, which are lipid lowering medication to reduce your cardiovascular disease potential. Yeah. Tell us about that story. Yeah, so you know, I'm chemical engineer by my first degree. So when they you know said Sergey, you need to take medicine, I said, no problem. You know, one month, two months, three months. And the answer was, uh, you don't get it. You're going to be taking this medicine till the end of your life. And this is where I've started to worry. And, you know, I've discovered this, there's so many ways to improve your health without actually taking the chemical substance inside your body. And this is where my interest in longevity started. So I started to consult and advise a lot of people around me. And then I end up with, you know, launching uh, 100 million uh, US dollars longevity vision fund to support technologies which would make us healthier. Now, you also mentioned that um, pharmaceuticals make a, a tremendous amount of money uh, from statins, uh, specifically around cardiovascular. Yeah. And I think back yeah. in 2018, it was some $1.2 trillion in market. So tell us about your focus in terms of you don't focus necessarily on the pharmaceutical side, but you focus on the technology side. Uh, so maybe you could share a little bit about LVF, and then we'll go back and talk a little bit about your journey to LVF. Okay, wonderful. So um, when, when I set up LVF, right, my mission is to change 1 billion lives. So my focus was on affordability and um, uh, accessibility aspect of longevity and health solution. And then you have kind of two options. One, you can go big pharma way, but then you need at least 2 to 2.5 billion to develop the drug. And then you need 12 years as well. Well, the other way, you support emerging technologies. And that, you know, I felt much more comfortable with this. You can do it with smaller ticket. Actually, a hundred million fund will be helpful to support development of 20, 30 different technologies. And I kind of find it exciting. And um, the speed of change in technological world is obviously, you know, much faster than in the big pharma world. And well, that's why we decided to support technologies. Even, you know, Fitbit today, or Apple Watch is your personalized healthcare device. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, you actually, you make a really interesting point, which is that if, if you're a venture fund and you're supporting pharmaceuticals, a $100 million fund will be lucky to support one or two f through their uh, FTC process. Uh, so exactly. I think focusing on a quicker payoff uh, or liquidation events and higher R IRR potential by focusing on tech is really the right approach. Uh, makes a lot of sense. You also claim that tech giants are potentially going to be the biggest healthcare companies in the future, and you just mentioned Fitbit and Apple. Tell us about your perspective there. Yeah, so when today when we talk about healthcare, um, we think about uh, big pharma, we think about hospitals, we think about um, different equipment, healthcare, equipment producers. I do believe in 10 years time, the largest healthcare companies on earth going to be Apple, going to be Google, going to be Amazon. And we see it already. There was very interesting report. I think it came uh, spring last year done by uh, Morgan Stanley. You know, Apple can get half of its revenue by 2028 from healthcare. And then, and then to be fair, I think Apple has done an amazing job in um, proving that they can change the landscape of every industry. And I think healthcare is going to be the, the next one for that. Now, as far as your fund goes, uh, in terms of the areas that you invest into and have interests, uh, one of those seems like it's early diagnosis of cancer and AI yeah. for drug development uh, as it pertains to longevity. Um, and I think there is a uh, portfolio startup called Freenome, which is an AI-based blood testing for early detection right. intervention, as well as uh, in silico medicine that uses AI to help with drug discovery and development. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I think we all have a lot of wake-up calls around us 
when you know people get cancer they uh, they've been very late in diagnostic of that and apparently their chances you know to recovery was pretty low so i started to look at the figures and what i realized if you do like really early detection of cancer inside someone's body recovery rates are amazing it's 93 to 100 percent for like me you know, main for top five main cancer types and i think it's just amazing opportunity not only to reduce healthcare costs but just reduce mortality from cancer because cancer and and cardiovascular disease is um is two main reasons for that in this world so when you when you look at freenom i mean today to uh do a diagnostic of colon, colon cancer you need to do colonoscopy you, you, and you do it like every five years, people delaying it. It's very invasive procedure. But with Freenome and AI-based diagnostic of that, you can uh, use your blood test to predict. Uh, and it's one of the most dangerous type of cancer. So that's Freenome. Well, the other interesting company is, is in silicon medicine. Um, we did start today with discussing that you know, drug development is 12 years process. But what about if you use AI to generate your target, your hypothesis for right drug development, you compress three first three years of drug development into 45 days. And that's exactly what in silicon medicine you know, do today. Uh, you know, I think it's just exciting development, which would obviously contribute to affordability and accessibility aspect of healthcare solutions around the world. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. Another area that you seem like you're very focused on is around genome engineering, such as CRISPR that involves uh, genome therapy as well as editing. Uh, tell us about your interest there. Yeah, so we're currently looking at at least five different companies who does uh, uh, work in genome therapy and um, you know, gene editing. I think this space is still at very early stage of development. So I'm not sure if we will find investable targets in the next 12 months. But what excites me is when you think about you know, three things which will change the overall, you know, longevity sector in the next 5, 10, 15 years. I think, you know, gene therapy and gene editing is one. Uh, it's stem cells is number two. And I'm personally excited about number three, which is 3D printed organs, replaceable organs, artificial organs uh, as well. So with this in mind, <clears throat> I love, you know, gene therapy because even <clears throat> today's gene therapy, Gene editing is more concentrated on like orphan disease, which is very rare genetical type of disease. You need to be like really unlucky in genetic lottery to get this disease. But if you can buy all the rare disease on earth and who's suffering from it, it's 300 million people. It's amazing. It's a substantial part of the population. So even today we can make, you know, significant change in that. There's it's a lot of ethical issues around that which I will not cover, you know, given our time sensitivity today. But that's just, you know, I think it's just amazing transformational technology, which we will really enjoy uh, the impact of in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah, I mean, you're working on some areas that is really, truly frontier. And I think, uh, like you said, some of these things are not going to come to fruition in the next year or two. Um, but in the next 10, next 20, it's going to be fairly transformational. Yeah. One of those areas, of course, is also stem cell treatments. So tell us about what you're looking uh, in, in there. Yeah. So, um, again, uh, remember, when we started Longevity Vision Fund, it's a 100 million fund. So by financial industry terms, it, it's really kind of small investment vehicle. But we were like one of the you know, largest uh, funds in the world. It just shows you how fragile and immature longevity as investment sector is. So the same applies to stem cells. So, and, and because of the kind of huge hype around that, you open up the newspaper today and then like, yeah, and then you read, you need to go to Mexico or Bahamas to do you know, like urgently stem cell ejection, right? You know, tomorrow you open up and it's still risky, it's not FDA approved, etc. So this whole space became very confusing. So we're actually looking at a number of different plays in, in the stem cells um, field. But what I also like is to experiment with, this, with the sources of the stem cells. So we're looking in the company who is just using um, a human placenta 
uh, as a source of stem cells. Human placenta is just amazing material. It's 100% natural, no you know, autoimmune reaction. And I think it's, it's pretty clean and innovative uh, source of that. So it's, it's very promising technology. We need to wait for another three, five, seven years until it's go through FDA process. But then in the end of these three, five, seven, even years, you know, our life will change. So that actually means that you have a pretty interesting horizon, but also a perspective where you're keeping tabs on these startups that are going through that process. And as soon as they are approved, there's an opportunity to snap them up, assuming that the valuation makes sense for your fund. Um, I want to come back to bioprinting, which uh, you mentioned before, and sounds like you're fairly bullish on. So tell me exactly what that means, and also talk a little bit about how they're countering the immune rejection of bioprinted organs. Yeah. So um, let me cover <coughs> let me cover the overall replaceable organ, sorry. It, and it and it goes from three D printed organs to regeneration of organs inside or outside uh, human body. 3D printing is, 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 I think it's exciting technologies which changed a lot already non-human industries or non-human application. When you go to use of 3D printing for organs or like in human application, it's becoming more and more complex. So if you look at the biggest bio, 3D bio printing companies today, majority of their revenues comes from academic institution. Actually, people buy 3D bioprinting and material for that for experiments, not for actual 3D printed organs. But having said that, if you wait three to five years, we're gonna see more and more uh, 3D printed models of the organs which can be used for transportation. And the problem is, because every organ, you know, use a lot of capillars uh, to be connected to the overall body. And, you know, so, you need to balance the simplicity of the 3D printed model and complexity of this integration inside the body. So that's, that's you know, 3D printing is promising. We've seen 3D printed um, things change a lot of industries. So human health and our ability to replace our body parts will obviously benefit from 3D printing. But still early, still more on academic institutions and experiments, not for immediate use. So then, if you think about um, regeneration of organs, we find very interesting companies been backed up by Jim Mellon, Juvenescence, and we were investor in, 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 the, in the last uh, round called Light Genesis. What they do, they just you know, put the nucleus of, for example, liver in one of our lymph nodes. And then this, your plan B for liver, your regenerated uh, liver just grows inside your lymph nodes in the course of three to six months. Well, that's amazing because one, it solves you know cost issue because from one donor liver you can actually implant these nucleuses in sixty to seventy patients. So that's great because there's a huge demand for don for livers you know to be donated. So that's one. Number two, it does solve autoimmune rejection because this liver you know, has been grown inside your body. So therefore, you know, body doesn't think it's a foreign organ and it doesn't reject it. So that's amazing technology. Again, very early, but it's so exciting to see like their early experiments. Yeah, it really is very exciting. And I think one of the things that uh, you indicate from a, from a mandate and a focus of your fund is that it needs to be accessible and affordable to all. Uh, that yeah. many times when we talk about life extension, it's often available only for the ultra rich. Here, you're trying to make sure there's mass adoption, which of course has a consequential uh, benefit of high high return for your uh, LPs. Why is that important? And then secondarily, which we don't have too much time, but just real briefly, uh, what are the downside of potentially living too long? Yeah, um, <laughs> you caught me with. Uh... Number two, well, downside of uh, living too long uh, is, is the one, you know, when we try to focus on life extension, we just need to make sure we extend the, the best part of our life, which I think is actually you know, 25 to 45, 25 to 50 years. Not in terms of you know, being the best time in, in the human cycle, but in terms of the capacity of our body to enjoy life, to produce the energy, to perform. So the danger of you know, a simplified version of life extension that 
the, is the risk of extending the kind of last years of our life where we you know, need the most support, where our body is in a very fragile scale, uh, stage. So that what I would say is the potential downside is we focus on the wrong part of our life to be extended. And, you know, my dreams that we extend, you know, all of us should live 200 years in 25 years old body. Yeah, not today, not in five years time, but it's a good kind of goal to have. Which brings me to your first question is why accessibility and affordability uh, is, um, is, is a key focus for us. Um, I just is a good friend of mine. So, yeah, um, she's a blogger and she just published prediction for the future. And one of the predictions that life extension technology is going to be extremely expensive and it's going to be like a social conflict in terms of you know, people trying to get access to it. This is what I'm trying to avoid. This world today is so, you have so many kind of points for conflicts, areas of disagreement. So what I'm trying to do is just kind of unify theme when we can support everyone's life to be healthy, you know, happier. And then, you know, if we all live 100 healthy and happy years, there's at least extra 25 years to realize our dreams. Well, certainly when it comes to curing diseases, uh, no, no disagreements there. Um, in tr couple, a couple of things, again, I, I just, I, I wish we had more time, but we don't, yeah. is that uh, like any good technology or neutral technology, let's take a brain uploading as an example, or brain interface, which, it, which we didn't cover, such as Neuralink and so forth, can be used for exactly what you talked about, which is income inequality and power inequality. So in the, in the hands of strong men who are uh, reigning uh, corrupt governments, life extension or longevity can be very dangerous because it further exacerbates and holds that power system longer. Um, how do you reconcile the fact that it provides such a great public benefit, but also leaves it for potential manipulation? Yeah, look, um, we, we call it horizon free. So, you know, brain, uh, AI, brain integration, human avatars is three to 5% of our portfolio. So we not necessarily focus on that one because it's really, you know, down the line. Uh, I think it's just next 15, 25 years until we we'll actually will uh, we'll enjoy the benefit of it. And <clears throat> I'm an I'm investor. I'm you know, a passionate man who wants to change the you know, uh, world for the better. So I, I don't know the answer to the world, you know, all questions and world's uh, biggest problems. What I, what I do know that your risk logic um, is applicable to everything. You know, think about nuclear power. You know, some people can use nuclear power to destroy kind of cities and and countries and some you know can use it to you know empower a you know, spaceship or create very cheap and affordable version of electricity and and it's it applies to everything in our life there's obviously there's a need for regulation there's a need for consolidated view on that one there's a need for you know great people with the great values uh, trying to use the you know, benefits of this technology rather than, you know, uh, amplify the risk of that. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's exactly why we have consortiums and organizations like the AI for Good that's working on ethical morality yeah. and other philosophical frameworks. Um, a couple of more questions and we'll wrap it up here is tell us about your role with the Longevity X Prize. Yeah, so... I don't know to what extent you're familiar with XPRIZE. You know, XPRIZE Foundation, the first outcome of that is, um, is what we know today as Virgin Galactic. So yeah, they, through uh, incentive-based competition around the world, they created the first uh, private spaceship. Then it was bought by uh, Richard Branson and then Virgin Galactic now exists. So what we're going to do is we take 10, 20 million dollars from the sponsor and I'm you know, now having dialogues with a number of interested parties. And then we go to the world and say, guys, you know, the first team who's going to do a traversal in, in, a, you know, statistically, um, in, in statistical sample of in a group of people, you know, going to get this prize. So what we're going to do is we use different biomarkers to define biological age. 
there's plenty of biological clocks today available, and probably the most um, the fam famous of it is the one that's done by Steve Corbett. So you measure your biomarkers, you wait for 12 months of application of particular intervention or technology, and then you see whether you kind of became biologically younger or older, and what's the age reversal potential of this particular technology or this particular intervention. We do expect that it's going to be 200 to 400 teams all around the world participating in this competition. And again, it's all pro bono. It's just for the sake and with a focus to develop affordable and accessible version of age reversal technologies. Sounds great. And today I've been joined by Sergey Young, founder of the Longevity Vision Fund. Thank you for joining, Sergey. Thank you.